everyone who has dialed in for this uh, for this webinar on China, on the China offshore market. Um, as Alyssa said, I'm heading um, GVEX Market Intelligence Unit, and by that um, we look at market development, market insights, um, we do forecasting on the market. And I think the Chinese offshore market is actually a very relevant and very interesting area to look at for at the moment. Um, in 2018, China was the largest offshore market with 1.6 gigawatt of new installed capacity. And um, GVEC Market Intelligence actually expects that China will surpass the current largest um, offshore market by total installation, that is the UK, in the early 2020s with reaching more than 20 gigawatts of installed capacity. Um, this webinar is to give you an update on the current market situation, to provide insights on, um, on barriers of new entrants and opportunities for foreign um, entities to do business with Chinese developers. Um, I would like to, first of all, thank for our speakers to, um, to take part in this webinar and thereby also introduce them. Um, we have today with us um, Mr. Yu, Head of Industry Research of the Chinese Wind Association, Wind Energy Association. And we also have with us today Hubert Beaumont, Director from Azure International. They both gonna share us their perspective on the Chinese offshore wind market. And as a first speaker, I would like to introduce my colleague Feng Xiao, Director of Strategy with GVEC, who will give you an update on the Chinese and on the global offshore market. I would like to hand over to Feng, um, and um, as Alyssa said, if you have any questions, please use the text box to type in the questions and we will go back to the questions after the presentations. Feng, up to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Karen. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to join the webinar. And good morning for Europe and good afternoon for Asia Pacific. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes to quickly go through the global offshore wind market uh, status and a lot look. Um, before that, I have to quickly uh, introduce GWAC. Uh, as everyone uh, understood, we are a trade association and we are the voice on behalf of the global wind industry. Uh, we are the most active lobby body for the international wind market. We are currently playing a leading role in opening up and developing the new market for the wind industry. Uh, we have membership uh, coming from the industry. Uh, from the slides you can see, uh, we, uh, we have members uh, consists of the turbine OEM. You can see out of the top six, there are turbine OEM, there are members, and we have the leading developer in both onshore and offshore sector. We also have the service providers um, for the international market as well. Uh, one thing I want I'd like to mention, uh, as Karen uh, mentioned a bit, uh, in Bilbao during the wind Europe, uh, we launched the global. Uh, Wind industry market intelligence. This is on top of the existing report database plus the well known FTI report and database. So we have this uh, market intelligence program available to our members, also available to the non members. So far, we have released our global wind report uh, in the middle of April. We also uh, released our global supply side data. Uh, right now, we are working on our global offer report and global offer project pipeline, which is going to be ready uh, in one or two weeks. Uh, throughout the year, from the table of content, you can see uh, we are going to offer more report plus the database 
uh, we have the policy update for some emerging market as well. Uh, if you are interested in, in our market intelligence product, you are welcome to contact me and my uh, colleague Karen. Um, as I mentioned, uh, GWAP is really active uh, in the global offshore wind market. Uh, we are working closely with our uh, national or regional associate association partners throughout the whole world where organized event uh, almost everywhere in Asia Pacific uh, this year actually we're ha we're going to have uh, two global offshore wind summit uh, the first one global offshore wind summit Taiwan already took place uh, in the middle of uh, April uh, the upcoming one that's well taking place in the beginning of June in Yangjiang Guangdong province that's uh, the global offshore event China we co-organized with China Wind Energy Association and China Renewable Energy Industry Association. Uh, if you are really interested in to speak with the local uh, stakeholders and the policy makers, you are welcome to join us in Yangjiang in two weeks' time. Uh, now let's take a quick look about the global uh, wind market. Uh, Karen already mentioned China um, is the largest market. Uh, or at least uh, in terms of new installation from the pie chart in the middle, you can see uh, out of the 4.3 gigawatt installed globally for offshore last year, nearly 40% is from China. So, which means China became the largest market in terms of new installation for the first time in 2018. But cumulatively speaking, it's going to surpass the UK uh, in the beginning of 2020s as the largest market. So the the chart on, on the left side, on the right side, where you can see it's give you an indication about how rapidly the offshore wind has been growing in the past two, three decades. Um, at the end of 2018, we have 23 gigawatt installed, which means 3.8% of the total uh, installation that's from offshore uh, globally. But in terms of the new installation, where you can see 9% of the total new installation in 2018 is from offshore wind. So from both new installation and the cumulative installation, you can see offshore wind is absolutely playing and crucial roles. And looking forward, where you can see that's the latest uh, market outlook uh, released by GY, where you can see how we believe the market are going to grow uh, from today to 2030. So for the near term, the next five years between 2019 and 2023, we believe the cargo, the compound annual growth rate will be double digital. That's 11.3%. And in the middle term, actually the outlook is even better. So we believe the cargo will increase to nearly 13%. Um, from the color, you can see Asia is absolutely playing a dominant role uh, moving forward. Um, but in terms of the Chinese market alone, where we can see uh, from our business as usual, new installation forecast between now and 2030, you can see 50, per, uh, 50 gigawatt out of this 156 new installation is going to from one single country. That makes China is crucial, no doubt about uh, in the global offshore wind market up to 2030. That's why we feel it's in interesting and important to, to present something uh, like the topic today, doing business in Chinese offshore market. So that's the um, market status and outlook uh, up to 2030. Uh, before I stop, I just want to show uh, once, one more slide. This indicates the ranking from the supply side. That's one slide from our supply side data released in the middle of April. Uh, this slide indicates, you know, out of the top 10 offshore turbine suppliers globally, we have five companies from China. It's the same situation for the same um, general market. So Siemens Gamesa is a number one, but uh, the number two place it's the Chinese supplier S7. That's the wind business of Shanghai Electric. So uh, moving forward, uh, we still believe that the Chinese turbine will uh, on the top 10 list for a very long time due to the market, out, market outlook we just presented. 
So now I'm going to stop and hand over to uh, Mr. Uwe from Sevilla. Thank you. Hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, good morning and good afternoon from Beijing. My name is Yu Guiyong from Chinese Winner Association, and uh, I'm very happy to be invited by Zhivike to speak on the topic of doing business in China's offshore wind market. So during the following uh, about 15 minutes, I would like to share with you the market status and the potentials the future uh, policies and sub-cooperation opportunities between China and the international players. So <clears throat> the first slide shows the overall market performance in 2018, in the last year, including onshore and uh, offshore. Uh, so we can see there's 28 gigawatts new installation in China and uh, which makes the total reached a uh, 210 gigawatts. So in terms of offshore wind, we can see there is great uh, market growth, a great potential, um, but meanwhile, we also uh, sense the great pressure. <clears throat> so we can see in the last year, there's 1,855 megawatts uh, new installations. Um, and then which makes the total to four point about five about four point five gigawatts, which makes China the third biggest on, uh, offshore wind market uh, for, uh, following UK and uh, Germany. <clears throat> so this slide shows the distribution of the annual installation, um, which is located in seven provinces. And we can see that Jiangsu province has the biggest share, about 58%. Um, uh, so as we show above, the last year's China's offshore wind had a, a record high growth rate, and uh, uh, just uh, Feng Zhao mentioned uh, as likewise. So we can see the, the micro background for this achievement, maybe mainly from the technological foundations. So we have uh, the appearances for um, more than 10 years. Yes. Uh, for example, like the uh, uh, offshore booster stations, like the long distance cable laying technologies, like the vessels, and also the maturity of wind turbines and the foundation structures. So it makes our, uh, make us going to deeper waters. Uh, including the floating structures uh, technologies. So in terms of the large scale wind turbines, we see it's getting bigger and bigger. And the last year we saw the um, uh, uh, more than, uh, they, they're bigger than uh, six megawatts uh, turbines have installed. And uh, also at the very beginning of this year, Mingyang has installed the uh, 7.22 uh, 22 megawatts semi-directed drive to buy in Guangdong, uh, in Guangdong province. And uh, very soon, I, I believe we will see the six, uh, eight megawatts and uh, 10 megawatts turbines will be installed. Uh, uh, maybe first for the prototype. And also, <clears throat> besides the technologies, Policy is the uh, prominent driver for offshore wind development in China. We believe, especially from uh, 2016, the feeding tariff for offshore has been issued and the clear and definite subsidy policy actually stimulated the growth. So, but now we are changing the policies from feeding tariffs to competition bidding to reduce the subsidy burden just now, as I mentioned above for the uh, pressures, we have great potentials, but also we have the uh, pressures. So we got to move from the feeding tariffs policy to market competition to reduce the cost. 
and meanwhile, the projects approved before the end of two, uh, 2018 can be granted the peer previous price. Uh, but there is a condition that means they have to be commissioned before the end of 2021. So since the 2018 from this year on, all offshore projects and the, their prices are decided, decided by uh, bidding. So that's a, a big a change for China's today's offshore wind policies. But anyway, our future potential uh, for the offshore wind market is definite, and we are we see that very positive because we enjoy a relatively good policy environment. Uh, we have 2013, we have 2015 energy uh, transformation targets, and also we have the uh, a P, uh, RPS, that means Renewable Energy Portfolio Standards, just issued last week uh, by the NEA and the DRC. So it will push the coastal provinces to use more uh, renewable energies. So we're seeing, uh, we believe this is a, a very strong stimulus for the market. So in terms of the planning and the future potentials, according to the 13th five-year plan for wind power development, by 2020, there will be five gigawatt offshore wind capacity get grid connected and fully commissioned. And the scale under construction will be around 10 gigawatts. The first charter illustrates the distribution of the province in the plan. And for the second charter, you can see there is a much more bigger one get approved. But as a matter of fact, the capacity approved from 2011 to October 2018 is much bigger, rise, uh, reaching 133 uh, gigawatts, excluding the installed capacity about 4.5 uh, gigawatts. So there's still about 100 gigawatts vacancy for the market. But this is not including approved capacity at the fourth quarter of 2018 by local governments. Because the FIT subsidy policy will change from 0 0.58 yuan uh, per kilowatt hours to bidding price with a capital price, that means there is an upper limit, no more than a 0 0.8 yuan, that means 80 cents Chinese yuan, uh, or maybe 75 uh, Chinese yuan, 75 cents in terms of Chinese yuan, we will see soon. So it is reasonable to and understandable to see uh, big capacity rushing to get approved in order to get the previous higher price. So for now, uh, there is about uh, 12 gigawatts under construction and about 15.5 uh, gigawatts get approved but not start construct yet. So during the subsidy declining process, we estimate that there will be a strong market performance in the following five to 10 years due to different reasons. Um, from now to 2021, 20, the next following uh, three years, we will see a little bit of a rush installation and construction in Chinese waters, approximately uh, three to four gigawatts per year, per year, but no more than five gigawatts. Considering the limits of marine engineering and uh, construction equipment, like the vessels and uh, cranes, so they, these uh, conditions will limit the the growth rate of the Chinese offshore market. Projects approved before the end of eight, eighteen uh, can be granted the previous uh, price. When they are commissioned, uh, just now as I mentioned, when they are commissioned bef before the end of uh, the next year, I mean 2021. So since 2019, all offshore projects and their prices are decided through bidding. So the next stage is from 2021 to 2025. This five years, subsidy policy still exists, but will drop and decline. Our offshore wind projects have bidding price. So we estimate, we estimate the annual market could be uh, three gigawatts. 
cost reduced by technology improving and the industry chain uh, continues maturing. After 2025, offshore wind reaches great priority state in China, we, uh, at, at least we hope so. And the restrictions of technology and cost nearly disappeared. The only limit will be resource conditions, including great flexibility in the coastal areas, wind energy resources, uh, sea space utilization policies. So the annual market growth could be even more stronger maybe five to eight gigawatts, we suppose. So on the whole, we are confident with the potential and the prospects for Chinese uh, offshore wind industry. In the next five to six years, maybe uh, we will gain greater parity and we will win the market uh, competitiveness. During the process, we uh, welcome the Chinese market, welcome the international expertise and uh, companies join us for the better and stronger uh, industry chain building. Uh, at last, uh, uh, just now, as uh, Feng mentioned, we still uh, welcome again you to attend our Global Offshore Wind Summit, which will be held at the very end of this, uh, this month in, China, in Guangdong, China. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to hand over to you. You go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. And thanks, Ms. thanks everybody for joining. Actually, uh, Mr. Yu and myself were together in the same room in the new office in the CWA. Very nice office, by the way. Very comfortable here. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Karen, for saying my name with a, a very nice French accent. I appreciate the effort. Um, so very glad to talk a bit about our experience here uh, doing business in, the, in China's offshore wind market. Uh, first, just briefly, let me say a word about myself so you, you, you know who's on the other side of the computer. Uh, so I'm, I'm an engineer in hydrodynamics from École Centrale de Nantes in France. Uh, and after graduating, I came here in 2006. So I've been in China for 13 years. Uh, I think by now I'm considered fluent in Chinese. Uh, this whole time I've been working in the in the wind industry. Actually, when I tried, I started already at, at Azure International, the company of which I'm CEO today. Uh, back then, I was responsible for uh, for working for foreign investors. We were developing wind farms in uh, in the Mongolia. Uh, my role was to go to in the Mongolia to install met mast, uh, do wind measurements. We were interacting with local design institutes for feasibility studies uh, to secure approvals, etc. Uh, back then, actually, the, the end of the story didn't go very well. A few years later, in 2009, with the financial crisis, uh, we failed to prove that we have the financial capability to build the wind farm. Uh, so we ended up selling it. Uh, but I must say that 10 years later, I see the landscape has changed a lot. And I've been back to Inner Mongolia since then, and it's basically a blanket of wind turbines. Uh, it's been built way beyond our expectations or even best dreams. Uh, and today, I, I do believe also since then, we, we've been working more with foreign investors who have continued uh, limited but continued interest in the Chinese market. And I think especially recently renewed interest. And I must say that the, the whole environment uh, is much more suitable uh, for, for the, the participation of foreign companies now, at least we believe. So we'll say a bit more about this. A uh, quick word on our company. So we're here since 2003. Uh, we work uh, especially in China and uh, new energy. Uh, specifically for wind, we work on two aspects. One, we work with foreign investors coming to China, uh, and we help with as advisors for strategy, uh, market research. We have our own market databases, but we also do uh, technical and commercial due diligence. We did a number of those. Basically, all foreign investors that have been to China. I think we uh, we ended up working with them at some point. Uh, and the other, the other half of what we do is more in the technology and, and technical side, where we partner with European companies to deliver technical services to uh, Chinese players. So we also uh, provide services to uh, the Chinese developers, uh, design institutes, uh, turbine manufacturers, etc. I'd also like to uh, point out that uh, uh, every week, every Monday, if we're on time, we share um, five news items that we select from the, the Chinese energy transition uh, sector, the whole landscape, 
it's not meant to be exhaustive, but it's meant to provide our readers with an ongoing uh, view and an exposition on everything that's happening here, and there's a lot happening. Uh, but if you want to stay connected and, and hear regularly names such as NEA, NDRC, Three Gorges, etc., uh, you can go to our website and subscribe for free, and we'll uh, continue to update everybody. So jumping in the topic, actually, I, I wanted to uh, share some data with you about the, the status of the offshore wind, but I think our two friends have done that uh, very well. And Mr. Hughes also shared a lot of data, on especially what's happened on the policy more recently. Uh, so maybe I'll do this pretty quickly and, uh, and, and move on the key points here. The, the key message is we basically the same as Mr. Hughes has been. If we look at the, the past years, we looked at 160 projects with a total capacity of 55 gigawatts. Looking at the chart on the right here, 82% uh, of that is just approved. Uh, actually, still a small portion is, is in construction or already in operation. Uh, but what we wanted to point out here is that out of these projects, a large majority of, these, of this pipeline is owned by state-owned companies. Um, so 26% is owned by the big five. So these are names you'll see quite often if you come here. Uh, Hua Dian, Hua Nang, Da Tang, SPIC, CEI, China Energy Investment, which is a merger of Guo Dian and Shenhua. Uh, these are the big five, of course, uh, very present in the energy sector here. Uh, and then out of the small four, as we call them, CGN, uh, China General Nuclear and Three Gorges, each have about 16, 17% of the pipeline, including the projects just approved. Uh, so we see already a majority of projects in the, in the hands of uh, about seven state-owned companies. Uh, and then the breakdown of the rest, also state-owned companies. So if we see 8% for UDN, that's actually Guangdong Energy, 12% for Funang, that's Fujian Energy. So these are provincial energy utilities. Uh, and then actually here we have a bit of a, also an interesting fact that in, in the rush for uh, approvals that was described earlier, uh, actually the government ended up handing up a project pipeline to some of the turbine manufacturers. Uh, so Shanghai Electric has a number of approvals and so does Minyo. So this may also open to a new dynamics in the market. Uh, but keeping this in the background, let, let's look a bit at, the, at, at what also the, uh, the other interesting fact is that it's all been approved recently. So basically all these projects, uh, a, a, a large majority of them were, were in two provinces, Jiangsu, which, was, which is still the leader in offshore wind in China, and Guangdong, which is uh, announcing that it will catch up given the, the scale of the approvals last year. So in Guangdong in particular, we had about 20 gigawatts of project approved just in December and November last year. Uh, in Jiangsu, also in December, 10 gigawatts just approved. Um, and so why was that? Uh, why so many approvals in December? I think Mr. Yu already explained that there's a bit of history uh, as, as to how the F FIT has been evolving. Uh, I think actually the final draft is not really issued yet, but it seems that now the final resolution is that, uh, Mr. Yu, you can, you can, uh, <laughs> you can uh, see if, I say if I'm wrong. Uh, the final resolution is that we're coming back to the fact that all projects approving, approved in 2018 can get the 0 0.85 feed-in tariff if they connect before the end of 2021. Yeah. But this is still a draft, or uh, it's, it's the issue of a conversation. Yeah, we have to see. Uh, we will issue it very soon. It will be issued very soon. So we accept because it's, there's been several drafts. We hope this one won't change. Uh, it, should, it should stay the same. So what does this mean? Uh, same, we did a number of estimates. Uh, by 2021, I think we're a bit more aggressive in the, in the ramp up. But you were saying 15, we're saying about 20 gigawatt of offshore uh, between today and the end of 2021 that uh, should be able to, uh, to get this feed in tariff. Beyond that, and of course with most of them in Jiangsu and Guangdong, uh, beyond that, most projects will have to go through a competitive feed-in tariff, which uh, for investors introduces a bit of uncertainty or opportunity uh, as, to, uh, as to what this tariff should be. Um, so before I move on and, and talk a bit about the opportunities and or the, or the strategy for foreign investors in China, I just wanted to, uh, to present this background. So in the, in the, the whole situation with you, you have local governments, uh, and state-owned developers, basically, and turbine manufacturers, the whole supply chain, uh, locally rushing to build as much projects as possible before 2021 uh, in order to, make, to, secure, to secure maximum subsidy revenue. And in the background is the central government, who wants to support the industry, of course, uh, to help it to move 
forwards in a healthy manner with reducing costs uh, step by step, but who, of course, the central government wants to limit the financial burden. Uh, subsidies, payment of subsidies is already an issue for onshore wind and solar because it's, uh, the, the, the subsidies are actually not paid by the government but collected by the electricity users. Uh, and so there's, there's today already a bit of delay between the moment that the projects are connected and, and when they actually start collecting subsidies. Uh, so of course the central government has an, on a high level of the agenda to reduce the subsidy burden. Uh, so that the whole sector now is, is, I must say in this background, pretty busy uh, and, and trying to build a lot of projects very quickly and while well controlling the cost. So this is good to, uh, to keep in mind when we come to China. Um, and so with this in mind, I, I wanted to break down maybe in four types of, of uh, opportunities we may look at here. And we're, we're already working with some foreign investor in the, in the Chinese market. Um, on the top line here, we have with time, so we, we can try to, to uh, invest in some of these projects. Uh, that have the full feed-in tariff of 0 0.85. That means that these projects have to connect before 2021. Uh, or we can aim at projects that will come later on, in which case it will be a lower FIT. It will be competitive, but it will definitely be lower and have a ceiling. Uh, and on the left, we could either try to partner with state-owned companies uh, or local companies. Actually, there's, there's different options. This is a simplification, of course. Or we could, uh, as a foreign investor, try to you know, secure our own pipeline, secure our own projects, develop them, uh, and do everything by ourselves. I think these are technically the, the options. Uh, in the background, so I think because this question may come up, this legally it's it's absolutely possible for foreign companies to uh, to uh, invest uh, in the Chinese offshore wind market. Uh, it's not the the main uh, trend for the moment, but nothing is stopping foreign investment. Uh, Actually, there's some Hong. Kong, if we look at the pipeline, some Hong Kong-based investors are securing project approvals. Uh, and any foreign investment is treated legally the same way as a Hong Kong investor is. Uh, so there's really uh, there's, there's there's some opportunities to do so, and uh, there's there's a number. Of Uh, to build it, to make sure they get the tariff associated to it. Uh, and also, our local partner, uh, the state-owned partner typically has enough financial capability to take the project by himself. And financing is not an issue because they also have a number of banks uh, that are actually queuing up to, to, to finance these, uh, these nice projects with good returns. So they're hard to get. Uh, however, we do believe there's opportunities to, to follow that option. Uh, this is where we have experience already. We've worked on such projects so in this first box, so I can say a bit more about um, our experience uh, in that regard, specifically what, what Azure was responsible for, which is the, the, mainly the technical due diligence of a project uh, in this stage. So I move on. So and just to go through these, uh, these points, maybe one by one, so bear with me. A number of points addressed here. So, of course, there's challenges for, for us to come invest, uh, for a foreign investor to invest in such a project. Uh, on, on paper, if you look at the feed-in tariff, uh, now in Jiangsu, the capex would be about 2 million euro per, per megawatt, a bit more in Guangdong. Uh, utilization hours would be about 2,500, maybe more. Uh, so we think on paper, actually, if th this works in the financial model. Uh, these are good projects. Uh, if this doesn't work in the financial model, there's maybe not much point in moving forward because the, the, the feed-in tariffs would be lower, even though we hope the capex would come down in the future. Uh, but th these are actually good projects. Uh, the challenge is really in, in being able to assess the project fast enough and also signing up the partner without losing them halfway also if they're, if they're really busy and, and they're moving forward at a speed which is actually sometimes the speed of construction may be even faster than the speed at which we assess the project. Um, so some of the challenges are regarding documentation. Uh, typically, all documents here will be in Chinese, sometimes only available in paper version. Uh, maybe sometimes we have to be reviewing them on site. Uh, permits, this we've done for onshore as well, is not very different. You always have to assess permits in the, in the local context, which is, which is very local. So for different provinces, you will have different regulations uh, for the set of documents you need for the project to be 100% legal and, uh, and be constructed. Um, project design. 
I think from the engineering perspective will be a bit, uh, you'll be facing some new challenges as, as maybe uh, Western investors, uh, as the, the design is done by, uh, essentially by accredited design institutes, which are also stay, mostly state owned, not all of them, and has have this accreditation that gives them the right to do the design for these large engineering projects. They actually do the whole engineering. Um, the methodology used is in some aspect the same, in some other aspect different uh, from what we do in Europe or US or elsewhere. Uh, so you you have to work closely with the design institute uh, to uh, to catch up on the on the design or to align. Uh, data confidentiality is a notorious issue. Uh, you have to set up mechanisms to make sure that this data, the, the the sharing of data is controlled. Sometimes some of the of the raw data analysis may need to be done uh, in situ on on the site. Uh, wind resource assessment or energy uh, annual energy prediction also uh, is maybe a different methodology in China versus the rest of the world. Uh, so you have to work with the Design Institute again to try and understand how they did the, the, the yield calculation and the losses they use. Actually, typically in China, we or Design Institutes don't use uncertainties, for example, uh, or P50, P75, P90. Design Institutes would use a, a different approach with maybe a slightly more a uh, slightly larger loss factor. Uh, by the end of the day, it, gives, it provides a result that the investors understand here, uh, but you might need to, uh, to learn a bit how to understand it yourself. Next, the supply chain. If you invest with a local state-owned partners, uh, most likely most of the supply chain uh, will be local. Uh, and sometimes given, uh, well, you may have experience with some of these turbines or not, so you have to uh, be, get comfortable uh, with these turbines and uh, and these foundation, these construction yards, uh, these ships, etc. So this takes a bit of an effort. Uh, on the contracts, and this is maybe a key point uh, to prepare for. The, philo the whole philosophy for signing up contracts is a bit different here, if I, if I may say philosophy. Also due to the legal environment, the whole legal system is different than what we would have in Europe. Uh, and so if there's any way, or the, maybe a simple illustration is that if there's anywhere we can say that the, the client is king, that's definitely, uh, that's definitely the case in China. Uh, however, you do have to look into the contracts in detail and, and derive uh, some risk analysis, uh, which can be sometimes uh, it requires a bit of creativity, given that the whole contracting approach is different from what you would have done in, uh, in Europe or US, uh, and also may have some space for optimization. Uh, further on, team structures, probably teams, we have found that actually teams have less people than we would expect in Europe, uh, because a lot of the work is subcontracted to the supply chain. Uh, so you, we have to get familiar with these teams. Uh, HSE is another key issue on the list. The practices here are still a bit lagging uh, in our own assessment. So then you can work with the partner, provide training, or by the time you're in a partnership together, make sure everybody is aligned on these practices. Uh, grid offtake, this is something we do as well, requires a uh, project-specific assessment, as well on the PPA, but also on potential curtailment risk. Of course, the key advantage of offshore wind is that it's along the coast where there's strong energy demand, so we expect there's no curtailment. However, we are talking about fast. Other areas where moving forward, there's less and less of these projects that have feed-in tariffs available. Uh, so we will be, as for investors, looking into projects that uh, need to compete for FIT. So there's still a bit of uncertainty into how this will uh, roll out. Uh, the basic setup is that uh, every project owner keeps their project. Uh, they present for a feed-in tariff, uh, and the owners with the lower, the lower feed-in tariffs get to build their projects first, and the other ones get to wait. I'm making another chance maybe next year, so I still, I'm still not sure I take on the, 
on the period at which this will be assessed. Uh, but this is all new, including for onshore. So uh, by, by the time it happens to offshore, we'll have time to, to, uh, to have a few references there. Um, the advantage is that then uh, in, there's more time uh, to participate in design. And I think that's also interesting for foreign investors to bring in some expertise from Europe in the, in the design, the optimization, uh, whether we talk foundation design or even contract risk optimization, uh, bringing some expertise from Europe to optimize the project uh, could be interesting here. Uh, so I think this, this is also a right path to follow. Further on, and actually this box here doesn't really exist anymore because it's maybe too late. Uh, whether we can still find projects that we can own 100% but still have the FIT is probably too late for that unless we partner with some of the private companies. So we didn't show it, but in the, in the remaining percentage of projects that are not state-owned, there are some private companies, both local and Hong Kong investors that have pipeline uh, project rights uh, in China. I think maybe here's a, a good place to answer that question about how to secure project rights. Uh, and maybe I say just two words about the rules of the game for, for this here. Of course, China is a big place. Every, every province, every city will have maybe different uh, practices. This is why there's many opportunities. Uh, but overall, we see that the, the, the local governments have a strong say in allocation of pipeline. And what the local governments want in exchange for, for allocating pipeline is to create local industry. Uh, they want the local industry to grow and people to come in and invest, build factories, employ people and pay taxes. Uh, this is why recently at the end of last year, Shanghai Electric and Minyang were able to uh, secure a pipeline directly uh, because they're the ones building the factory. O otherwise, what we've seen is that there would be some strategic agreement uh, between a state-owned company or, or an, any large developer uh, and a manufacturer and the local government uh, where they would work together uh, to, to make sure that all the parties involve uh, benefits, so there would be creation of local uh, industry complexes with, with participation of turbine manufacturers, but also the rest of the supply chain, uh, yards, boat, construction, everything is welcome. Uh, and then the project developers would secure pipeline in the process with some kind of intention to use that local supply chain. Um, Hello, everyone. Um, sorry for uh, for these inconveniences um, that we are experiencing here right now from with the with the audio. Um, I hope that Hubert is is coming back on soon. Um, we're trying to fix this uh, right now. Um, again, very very sorry for the inconvenience here. So in the meantime, um, as we're trying to fix uh, 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 to fix the the technical um, issues here, I think um, we can already start with the uh, with a few questions, and um, our our colleagues sitting in China um, can can join in. Um, as said, um, we might not get through all questions here. 
Um, but we will also do follow-ups with you um, at the end of uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, maybe um, Feng, um, you can also start with with your perspective because I think we received a, quite an interesting question that uh, uh, hopefully our colleagues and uh, sitting in China can also answer. But maybe starting with you, Feng, um, from uh, from a technical or, or a commercial perspective. Um, from your point of view, what do you see is a is a challenge in the Chinese offshore wind industry at the moment? Thank you, Karen. You mean from the technical point of view? Te technical or commercial, both or or either or. Yeah, I think from the technical point of view, uh, there is one thing I think for the uh, foreign investor need to be aware of. For the Chinese offshore market, uh, we basically we call it all offshore, but it consists of two parts: it's intertidal and or the nearshore project. Intertidal is mainly located in Jiangsu, uh, a little bit in the Jiang province. That's the region where you have the intertidal, which means sometimes um, you know uh, it's offshore. Uh, the summertime, when when the tide went up, it's it's offshore. Uh, but in, in, in a certain period of the year, it looks like an onshore. Uh, but the, the challenge here is that, you know, because the, the, the inter, intertidal, so sometimes the big vessels doesn't work there. Uh, for example, they jig up the vessels. Uh, it's really difficult. If you have your legs suck into the, the you know, the seabed, uh, it's really difficult uh, to make it work again. That's why um, for the earlier project built in, Jiangsu province, you see uh, the largest developer uh, for offshore in China, Nongyuan, they built their own heavy installa installation vessels um, for those projects. It's not that technically they cannot build the um, jackal vessels, that's the one we use here mostly in Europe. It's mainly uh, due to the um, technical challenge. But for the rest of the coastline, I uh, like um, Shanghai, uh, further down to Fujian, uh, Guangdong, uh, that's typical uh, near show. Uh, for example, the the project uh, so far has been built in Fujian province and Guangdong. You saw basically the vessels. Uh, they are the jack up vessels here. Uh, we 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 see in Europe. Uh, that's a friendly and technical point of view. I think uh, that's something uh, in general we need to be aware of. There is a slightly different um, compared with uh, Europe or the other part of the world. Um, from the commercial part, uh, I guess uh, who but, um, the CEO of Azul has already uh, partially addressed some of the challenge. Um, from, for, for the commercial uh, part, I guess the best is to think about, uh, you know, who are you going to partner with? Uh, we have a long list of, you know, developer in China, but the top five or top four already account for more than half of the pipeline in China. Uh, so how your organization are going to cooperate with the local partner and pick up the right terms commercially, I think that's the crucial part. Um, in, in general, uh, when you are doing um, offshore business in China, maybe you, as an international investor, you somehow you have to adopt, accommodate uh, the local requirement uh, and regulation uh, by following, you know, the recommendation from your uh, partner, uh, some, you know, uh, to some extent, uh, you know, the the experience or knowledge uh, doesn't work and know how uh, in the Chinese offshore market politically, uh, commercially, and technically. That's uh, that's my uh, comment, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, uh, Feng, you nicely connected actually to another question um, that we had about uh, vessel capabilities and vessel capacities uh, being taken from Europe to the Chinese offshore market. Um, I mean, vessels as such can represent a bottleneck in the offshore market, but as my colleague Feng alluded to, um, there are different um, different setups, um, different uh, geographic needs um, that uh, do not make uh, it feasible for one-on-one -on -one use um, of vessels in the European offshore wind market and the, and the Chinese offshore wind market. Um, I think uh, another question um, that we can uh, discuss here is also um, 
this uh, this part about um, foreign companies investing in Chinese offshore, um, and maybe starting with uh, with you, Feng again. Um, the, the benefits uh, for both sides, for the Chinese and for the foreign companies, um, to to make such investments. Um, could you could you say a few words about that? You mean the mutual benefit for investing yes. in the Chinese market? Yes. Uh, I think I see uh, from the Chinese side. Uh, I remember this one slide from the CEO uh, used, uh, of Azua. Uh, you know, when the Chinese, big, especially those big utility, when they got a big pipeline, uh, the time, you know, the schedule is really tight. They want to get it built very quickly. Um, for the earlier stage of offshore wind development in China, it's fine. But uh, for as soon as the project has been removed from the intertidal to the offshore, in some case, it's real offshore. And there, I think the utility from China really need to learn from what we have uh, listened to learn here uh, in Europe. Uh, I guess that's uh, that's something absolutely they can benefit uh, instead of trying everything, you know, learn everything from the failure. Uh, there's certain things they need to think about by working together with the international uh, developer to to save the cost, uh, to, uh, try to get the risk uh, under control. Um, also. In terms of the uh, HSE, that's the health and, and safety issue. Uh, I was at one of the Chinese offshore a year ago from where I can see uh, the standard in terms of health and safety. That's a, a huge difference. I guess there's something that uh, the local developer should learn from the European or any other uh, foreign investor as well from the offshore sector. Um, from the international part, uh, I guess, no doubt about, I mean, uh, in Europe, uh, it's simple. Right now, it's the largest market, um, mainly the UK, Germany, followed up by Netherlands, Belgium, um, Denmark. Uh, in the pipeline, we're talking about even Poland uh, or Turkey. However, uh, our forecast, uh, if you all remember, uh, there is one slide I present uh, in this business as usual uh, scenario, uh, you can see uh, Europe is only going to build maybe uh, something between 50 and 60 gigawatt uh, out of this 150 gigawatt to be built in the next uh, from 2019 to 2030. So that means size-wise, there is a limit. However, the market is going to grow, you know, uh, from between now and 2030. And most of that will from Asia Pacific. I mean, as the international players, uh, I mean, grow or continue to develop uh, at home market in Europe, that's not the big enough. Therefore, uh, the big benefit for the international player from the Chinese market uh, perspective, that's mainly the size, the opportunity. And, uh, you know, uh, I remember the, C the former CEO of Vista mentioned in the China Wind Power Conference one day, you know, if you are not success in China, you cannot really call yourself international player. I think that's the same case for the offshore uh, in China. It will bring you a huge pipeline opportunity. If you can manage to work with the local partner or working along uh, in one way or another with, uh, with uh, the international financial institution, this will bring you a huge opportunity moving forward. Yes. Thank you, Karen. Yes. Thank you. And I think uh, we have our colleagues from uh, from China back on. Uh, happy to to have solved those technical issues. Um, maybe starting with uh, with you, um, Hubert. Um, we have a question here where I would also like to hear your view. Um, can you talk a bit about the hopefully mutual um, benefits of Chinese and uh, foreign investors? um to 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 join forces in the chinese offshore wind market does it work do you, you back
Okay, I think uh, I think unfortunately we we have those technical issues still. Um, as said, um, this is uh, uh, this is this is very um, very unfortunate. Um, we can hear you now. I don't I know. Can you? Yes, yes. Now I can hear you, Hubert. Okay, <laughs> you're you're back. Very good. <laughs> and uh, we still have uh, have a lot of attendees on the line. So if you could uh, elaborate a bit about the mutual benefits of Chinese and foreign companies in the Chinese offshore wind market. Yes. Um... I think in, in our experience, of course, it's it will be case to case per uh, per, per partner here. What we've seen is, is a few years back. There's, there's definitely a strong interest for Chinese investors to invest in the in the European market, uh, and maybe vice versa. So, of course, the first alignment would be if, if uh, on both sides uh, there's an agreement that there's invest, investment in both directions. Uh, however, we don't think this is a prerequisite. We also see cases of, of, of course, Chinese investors going to invest in Europe independently of the Chinese market and also vice versa with European, there's the Chinese uh, look, local state-owned companies that have pipeline and are welcoming some foreign investors to participate uh, without requiring uh, a swap or reciprocity. And we see that the, some of the drivers here uh, will be on the, on the on the diversity of the of the technical methodologies. So to welcome a bit of, of references and experience in a different environment uh, with a different set of methods. Uh, Europe, for example, is the birthplace of the wind industry and the offshore wind industry as well. So I think there's an interest to learn more from Europe. And uh, what what there's not no better way of doing so if, if a European than if a European invest invest in the project and you're guaranteed that they will bring uh, the best of their uh, of their capacity, uh, but also uh, the local governments level, we see that there's interest. Some some governments are mandated to attract foreign investment. I think it's and uh, this is uh, well maybe case to case, but partly as part of uh, of their of, of their mandates and the 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 the, the criteria they're trying to achieve, like foreign investment is accounted in a different way, and so locally uh, it can be perceived positively. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Yu, you have anything to add on this topic. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, by the way, we are back. <laughs> so, you know, just now, as Robert mentioned, the, the projects should be uh, assessed case by case, I think. So, for some projects, may be uh, uh, likely be under the national security assessment, especially when the projects near uh, military uh, sensitive areas. So, otherwise, uh, that should be much more easier. But on the whole, I think the Chinese will welcome the expertise of the international players to get in. To, uh, with their best practice, so we can uh, have the, the, the joint ventures. Uh, maybe the, the Chinese have the uh, Chinese has the holding uh, shares, so that would be much more easier for a kickoff to start the cooperation. Thank you. Thank you both, and I'm 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 very glad uh, that you came uh, that you came back. Um, maybe a final questions before we close, um, Mr. Yu. Um, could you tell us something what you see as uh, as a challenge to the Chinese offshore market right now? Maybe a technical challenge or a commercial challenge, from your perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for uh, your question. Uh, I think uh, for the challenges, we have different perspectives. I think they, uh, maybe the system challenges is uh, much more uh, uh, difficult for us uh, so far. Uh, we, we, now we have the technical uh, challenges, uh, like just now as mentioned, but that's not the biggest problem. The first problem is from the systems, uh, like the uh, uh, price systems, so the subsidy uh, price uh, policies. So uh, the, the the subsidy policies will de and the planning policies will determine the growth rate and our scale in the next uh, five years. So I think the the technology still exists, but uh, it's getting mature, and uh, or we can cope that with the international corporations. Uh, likewise, thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, and I know that we've already uh, surpassed our time. So um, I would like to um, thank our two speakers, Mr. Yu and Hubert Beaumont, um, and also, of course, my colleague Feng Xiao for this very interesting and insightful webinar. Um, please remember that the presentations will be shared with you. Um, you will receive them in an email. Um, we have a couple of questions that we weren't able to answer here yet, but we will go through them and get back to you individually um, to answer your questions. And with that, um, again, thank you for joining and I wish you all a good rest of your day. Thank you so much.